I'm giving everyone a minute. So we usually take a break after the slide, but we'll take a quick, everyone is around. Okay, so it wasn't just me, right? No, no, I got a okay. message saying that your meeting has been has ended because it's being used by someone else. Okay. I thought we were Zoom bombed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I really think that's what happened. That's the weirdest oh. thing ever. Oh yeah, could have been. Then I think you got hacked, Tisha. Go check all your money. Yeah, you know, that that would be my luck today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 2020. Anything can happen. <laughs> I agree with it's you. Very true. <laughs> very true. It's that kind of a year. We just need to get to January, right? I'm going to send an email. It looks like there's a couple people still not on, so I'll just shoot them an email, tell them to get back on. Sure. But okay, you can yeah, keep going. So we'll take this moment like a five-minute break. So everyone can stretch, come back, and we'll come back in five minutes. We'll leave the meeting on, and hopefully the meeting will be on when we come back. That works for me. I will make sure of it. Hey. Priya, just one quick question. Sure. So how often, so I'm new to all this, new to Lubbock, new to academia. Uh, how often do, do people actually get software through? I mean, it's... It, I know software is harder, especially in healthcare, because we have a lot of laws and stuff, but do people actually create apps and software through the, the hub? And have you seen that be successful? Yes. Oh, okay. So it's not right hard. now we have three teams out of our six accelerator teams, three or four, who are doing apps or software. One is in the healthcare space. She's doing oh. a diet. Oh, wow. Okay. And so it's not, it's not far-fetched then. Okay. That's good. No, you're not at all. Okay. Okay, I'm going to be back in by 3.45.
Everyone ready? Uh, yes. Okay, let's keep going. Because I realize it's 3.45, our time was still five and I thought we were going to be done early. Tisha is checking on me. Okay, so let's go. So the last part of it. So we talked about the four P's in marketing. So based on your market research, you're going to position yourself and then you know your product, what you're selling, you're going to state it, the price based on what your customer is willing to pay. Then the next part of it is the promotion. Where would you or how would the customer know about you? So if it's B2C, then you're going to talk about advertising, things like that. If it is B2B, you're going to talk about sales calls, going to meet these people, so on and so forth. So you have to decide who your customer is. So you do customer discovery to figure that out. And then based on that, what are they willing to pay? And so when you decide your promotional strategy, the best way to approach is to think about where do they normally find out about things? So for example, in your case, Darren, normally probably they find out in these big trade shows, right? So that would be the place where you'll get the maximum bang for your buck in terms of promotion. And for in a different case, so I'm trying to find, do we have a beat? So for the knife case, right? The, where would they find out? It might be a TV ad or an infomercial or something like that. It would not be a trade show. So think about who your customer is and where do they normally find out about these things, even social media. So, so now suppose I'm going selling something which is catered to the age group of millennials and younger. I would not use Facebook as a social media. I would use Snapchat and Instagram. If I'm going for the older population, it's more of Facebook, Facebook Twitter, right? And if I'm going for professionals like consulting services, it would be LinkedIn. So each platform has its uses and its demographic. So you need to understand the platform before you drop a lot of money on this story. And then the next part of it is placement. So now that they know about it, where exactly will they find you in order to buy it? So B2B often is on a website. B2C could be Amazon, stores, so on and so forth. Usually it's something that's like a cool and funky thing, like a chopping knife, maybe, Bed Bath & Beyond. So think about where would you place your product? So you will make all those decisions, you'll describe that in your business plan. So then the next part of it is operations plan. What is operations? Anyone wants to try? What do we mean when we say operations? Operations is the day-to-day. -day. So if I had to stratify the idea, you know, creating something is a project, right? Because it has a beginning and an end. Operations mm -hmm. is something that it's ongoing to for continuous. So if you're manufacturing widgets or knife cutters, you know, that you know, that operation, the, the things to create, that would be operation. That's operation. right. You're getting on the right path, right? So it's the how of a business. So what you make and what their marketing promises on your behalf, how do you make that thing? Whatever you promise to make, how would you make it is your operations. So how are you making your product or how are you providing the service? And how much will it cost for you to make or provide? Because remember we said price is set by your customer. So your only control is on the cost. So you need to understand how much it's going to make, how much you're going, it's going to cost you. Because the key formula for any business is, if I can make this thing work today, not today, never today. Well then, the key formula for a business is price equals cost plus profit or minus loss. Because the price is fixed. And how much it costs you would determine whether you make profit or loss. If you make loss, you're not lasting too long. Unless it is a pre-decided strategy 
to make loss in the beginning for future gains. But loss that is accidental usually doesn't allow you to last. So then the question is if the market sets the price and if it's going to cost me this much to make. So suppose the market is going to set the price at $1,000 and it is going to cost me $1,500 to make. Okay, not $1,500, $1,100 to make. What should I do? You want to focus on volume uh, potentially, or maybe you cut back so, on the quality. So, you know, you lower the price. So, you know, you have to you lower the cost, right? So you would think about cost cutting measures. So let us say I thought through all of them. I did volume, but I can't get to that volume too early. I can't get to the volume for five years. And so the volume is not working for me. I did everything that I could to make, to I cut the cost on everything that I could yet offer a product that's going to last because you don't want to sacrifice your quality such that it never lasts, right? So it's still going to last and it's going to cost me $1,100 to make and the market is willing to pay only thousand. What do you do? There are two options, either fine. Yes, Rich, go for it. You muted yourself. Scale back what you're going to offer. I mean, so if you're offering something with 10 options, offer five and, mm -hmm. and, take the, and iterate that through the process. You can scale it back. Yes, Corey. I think that you could go the other way and um, try and add value through experience or um, other measures that um, drive up the value from the perception of the customer that aren't, um, you know, aren't expensive from like, you know, the math, I guess, mm -hmm. exactly. you know, in, in things like hiring better salespeople, you know, or um, creating a marketing campaign that brings in uh, new customers, um, you know, stuff like that, stuff that isn't related directly to the product exactly. Right. But if you hire a salesperson, it's expensive, right? So you were going on the right path where you're going to try to do micro changes to have macro value change, right? Mm. Because in the end, price is a function of value. That's right, right? But if you find that you did all of those and it's still your price is lower than your cost, then it is not a viable idea. You need to go find something else, right? So one of the hardest decisions that entrepreneurs, so some of the things that entrepreneurs do mistakes, right? Is they never look at the cost. Even now I have six accelerator teams that I'm working with and they come the, with the pricing strategy and I say, how much is it going to cost? Oh, right. So if you do not focus on your cost, then you're going to get on your back foot. That's the first thing that's going to happen. And second thing, you're going to lose money because you lost the chance of making all the corrections that we just talked about. And if we made all those corrections and it's still not supported by the market, then you have a wrong product market fit and you need to what we call in lean startup pivot, move a different direction, find something else to do. Life is short, we have plenty of good ideas, find a different thing that someone else would buy. There's a reason I have never invested on my time machine. So it's all in my head, right? Because the price is going to be too, the cost is going to be too high if the technology can be proven anyway, okay? So how much it is always important to know how much it's going to cost to provide and what is your operating strategy? So we talked some of those. Do you want to be low cost or best cost? We never say high cost. It's a matter of optics. Same way, is your quality superior or workable? You never say low quality. If you look at uh, Walmart's thing, what do they say? Everyday value. They don't say low price. They don't say low cost, low quality, right? And then there's the difference, are you mass or customized? Which means, are you making one thing, million units of them, or are you making different things for different people? The Honda Civic versus the Ferrari. If I buy a Ferrari, I know for sure the car I have, no one else has. If I buy a Honda Civic, I expect to pay less because guess what? All my other student friends have the same, right? And then what level of automation are you willing to pay for? 
And then the last part of your operating strategy is what part of whatever you offer you're going to make and what part of it you're going to buy. And you have to do a cost analysis to decide which one of them. And based on that, you'll create an operating process. So there are different ways to look at operations. The one that I think is the cleanest to look through is called the process view of operations, where what you do is you break down, and I am really sorry that my pens haven't been working. What you do is you break down an operations into its steps. So we'll come back to Starbucks. So if we were going to do process view of operations for Starbucks, we would say, think about it. Step one, a customer comes to you. So what's the first step? You take an order. So there would be a block which says, take an order. The next block would be, would be stick a sticker on a cup. Then the next one would be grind the beans. Then the next one would be make the espresso. So you want to break down your process into as small steps as I just described so that you can control for each of them. So once you lay it all down like a straight block diagram, let me see if I can do it here and show it to you. Maybe that might be my answer. Recently, my pen has been feeling. So for Starbucks, I would say, Grind beans. And the next one would be espresso, make espresso, heat milk. Pour in cup, cup, pour in cup, mix. So basically, uh, you create a, a like a process map. Yes. Example, is it? So it look kind of like this. Can you see? Can you see? Right. You do it step by step. So once you have done that, then below each of this, you will write down. Okay, to create an order, what do I need? I need the machine, right? Remember, the ordering machine machine for orders, a credit card machine, a person. I need paper to print receipt. So below each block of your block diagram, you will write down all the resources you need and which of them are long-term capital resources, which of them you're going to use every day, operating resources. And based on that, you will calculate your operating cost, the capacity. So the other part of it is you're going to put above the block diagram. So I wrote down all the resources below, you see that? And above it, you're going to put time. So let's say it takes about three minutes on average to, for an order. Then it takes 15 seconds to grind the beans maybe 30 seconds for espresso. Then heating the milk, one minute. Pouring it in a cup, two seconds. Mixing it, two seconds. Serving, one minute, because the person may or may not listen to me, right? So if I did all of these times, it would be three plus 15, 30. It works out to four, four minutes. And for 50 seconds, that's what the math worked out to be. So that means if I had one person, only one person in the store, for to serve one customer, it would take me four minutes and 50 seconds. So based on that, I can calculate how many customers can I handle in an eight hour shift, right? So now I say, okay, that's too little. It doesn't make my math work because I want a certain volume. So I'm going to switch that and say, okay. So now let me think about which is my slowest process, the order taking, it was taking three minutes. So guess what? I'm going to have two ordering machines. 
So if you go to any Starbucks, you notice there's not one spot, there are two spots to give an order. So somebody did this math and decided the fastest way to do this. Okay, then second thing is, I'm going to have dedicated people for the order and somebody else to make the green. So I'm going to put the grinding the beans with the making of the coffee as one barista. At peak times, I'm going to have two baristas. All of those decisions are not by accident. And a process flow diagram is one of the best ways to help you create those decisions. So for anything, either you're doing IT, in IT you want to buy server space, how many people you can handle, all of those in each of your product cases or service cases, how many units can you sell is a function of how many can you make. And in order to understand what you can make, you need to do a process flow diagram. Does it make sense? Any questions on this part? It also helps you decide the layout. Where would you place what? So if you go into any store, any fast food, Starbucks, any of those, if you walk in, there's a way that the job flows. You walk in, you place the order, the barista is always, the next thing is always grinding of the beans. And then the next thing is the heating of the milk. If you go to McDonald's, you place the order, you go back and you see there is the meat cook being cooked, the buns on the side, the butter on there. Everything is laid out in a manner such that you can, your goal is to maximize the number of customers you can serve. So that is the process view of operations. Any questions? So I would encourage each of you, those of you especially serious about starting a company to lay it out and take it to as small a step as you can in order to understand how it's going to be, especially when you're converting it from a lab to a company. That's the step that sometimes you miss. And then you have too many orders and you don't, you don't know how to create them. You have a question, Dan? I do. So in something like this for, because you, you're using the fast food uh, or Starbucks as your mm -hmm. example, but if you're producing something that is, you know, my, do I draw this thinking of one unit, one widget of my methane reducing compound, or do I think of it as a 50 pound sack that I'm going to fill, sell to the producer? Or do I think of it as a batch that we're going to turn so into 50 pound sacks? You could do it in whichever unit you would sell it. What you're going to sell it is. Yes. So if you're going to sell it in a bag, then you would do it in a bag. So okay. often brewers for beer manufacturing, they do it in kegs. Mm -hmm. So in whichever unit you're going to sell it is what will be with how you will map it out. Thank you. Most Aaron, have you uh, been through the uh, hub class number two? Okay. Um, hub hub in, I'm so yeah. sorry. Are you asking if I've been through hub camp two? No, we're uh, we're in segment one of the hub uh, program, and then there's a, a, a second class that you'll have to go through. Have you been through that second class yet? No, this is the first. For me. The professor, oh, he was really dives into that and he talks about all the different people that you really have to like frame selling to you know because there's uh the end user you know and then there's the supplier and then there's like the decision maker in the supplier company and then there's always like some person that's in that guy's ear you know um and so as you're like creating your pitch you know you're really going to create like seven different pitches because you're going to end up having to present your idea to like everybody, you know, from top to bottom at some point. Um, and uh, it was really helpful for me to kind of um, think about, you know, my program from, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why we ask you to go to both of these. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm one and he's two, because I do the overview and he's some of the topics he dives, uh, dives deeper into. Okay. So the next part of it is risk analysis. So in your business plan, you should have, you should present a risk analysis. So the question is, what is a risk? What do you think is a risk? And what's the difference between a risk and a problem? 
Well, in in, um, in the project management space, which in quality space, which is my background, we a risk is more of something that's unexpected. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's just something you didn't expect. But you know, the different ways to mitigate risk. So, uh, but that's a whole nother topic. But that's right. You, you, and we're going to talk about that right now, right? That's exactly right, right? So the thing is that the probability of happening it is low. It is unexpected. So an ice storm in Lubbock in October is a risk. But a dust storm in Lubbock in June is not a risk. It's a probability. Right? So you have to think about it in terms of what's a highly probable or low probability. And so the second part of it is why do we care about risks? And why in the business plan do we talk about risks? Someone wants to try? So we care about risks because first we want to plan for them. Second thing, if we don't list them in the business plan, when we list them in the business plan, we show the investor that we have thought through them. And then the other part of it is when we don't list it, guess what the investor does? They do a risk analysis for you. And your goal from a business plan is always to stop the investor from thinking. All the data should be presented in a manner that's complete, that they look at it and they say, okay, 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 very good. Because when they start thinking, they think it always worse than you do, okay? So there are three types of risks. The operational risk, which is your day-to-day -day risk of somebody getting hurt, making mistakes, not meeting the quality that you planned, so on and so forth. And then, and so how do you correct for that? Usually through training. You train your employees, you have safety standards, you make sure that you have quality control, all of those mitigate operational risks. And you usually buy, depending on what you're doing, you may buy something called an errors and omission insurance to cover for operational risk. The next kind of risk is what is called strategic risk. That's a risk that you intentionally take in order for higher returns. So for example, you may choose to do business in other countries for increasing your market. But with that comes the risk of currency, the risk of sovereign. Of course, right now in the United States, there's a risk of sovereign risk, but let's see. And then the last one is environmental, which happens from what we call acts of God, which you know about these stories, right? Where it can be a tornado and the ice storm and all of those, and also the economy tanking or rising in all those. So these risks you mitigate through buying insurance. So in your business plan, you want to have risk management section where you talk about the different risks and you talk about how you're going to correct for each of these risks. What is the mitigation strategies? And then what we call is a sensitivity analysis you will do just like any experiment where you change one particular uh, parameter and you see the impact on the results. Same thing you will do is you'll change one of your assumptions in the business plan and you will see what your financial results look like. So the last part of our segment is any questions so far? Questions, thoughts, everyone still with me? Probably. Maybe just one question. Like, it, do we have to think about all the types of risks? It is good to think about it in types because then you can make sure that you've covered most of them, but it's not necessary to state it in types okay. in the plan. Does it make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay. So then the last part of it is the uh, financial statements. So there are three financial statements that companies use to gauge their overall health. So in the end, the goal of a company is to, what do you think is the goal of a company? Make, make a profit. Capitalism. Make a profit, right? Make money. Even if you are non-profit, if you start a non-profit, do you, is your goal not to make money? No, the, that, that's only a status for how you distribute funds with respect to the fund balance versus to investors. So, 
It's a, exactly. It's a way that you distribute funds. That's one. Second thing, you always want to make enough money to run your operations, to run your company. Okay, you may not charge a higher price because you're nonprofit and you're not trying to make exorbitant profit, but still you want to be able to meet your costs. One year we had a team that was talking, was doing something for homeless people. And we said, okay, where is your money coming from? And he said, it's nonprofit. Okay, how are you paying your bills? Huh. How are the lights running in your building? How are each of you going to eat your food and have a house? Right? So you need still money in order to run a business. So you use financial statements to compare to find out the overall health. So the first one is the balance sheet. It gives you the overall picture of assets, liabilities and equity. So it tells anyone what a company is worth at any given point in time, usually at the end of a measurement period. So, okay. so by assets, what do we mean by assets? What do we say when we mean assets? It's things that you own, like things that you land, own. equipment, things yes. like that. Right, building, plant, equipment, right? And the way to think about assets is if you decide to sell your company, the assets go with it. So that is your asset, things that you own. And then liabilities. The things you're going to have to reconcile at some point and pay, whether it's bills or prepaid credit cards, those kinds of things mm -hmm. that will deduct or lower your lower your assets or owner's equity. That's right. So that's things that you have to pay. So things that you owe. So assets is what you own. Liabilities is what you owe. And equity is the difference between the two. So equity is what you really own. So if you have bought a machinery that cost a million dollars, you went took a bank loan for 750,000 quarter of a million, then you owe that 750,000 plus interest to the bank, right? And so in the end, your equity in that is 250,000. So the basic formula for balance sheet is assets equals liabilities plus equity. So the next statement that companies look at is income statement. Income statement is the statement of day-to-day -day income and expenses during a certain period. So if you notice in the balance sheet, I said at a given point in time, that means it's cumulative period after period, year after year. So last year's, it is not that when the next year starts, everything goes back to zero and you start at the beginning. But an income statement, it resets at the end of each period and it is only for that duration. So it's for a year or a quarter or a month, however. Income statement is often in QuickBooks and all, it's called profit and loss statement. It's the same thing. And then the last thing is that, so in income statement, sorry, we have our labor, the people who work on the product, material, things that we use to make the product, not things that we own. So what comes in your income statement, all the material that comes in is things that are used to make the product and then anything which is called the overhead. Overhead by definition is the cost of doing business, like lights, like so water, lights, utilities, so on and so forth. Now, in the case of Kori, for example, since you are using water to make your product, which is the fresh fruits and vegetables, probably water is not an overhead for you. But in most cases, water being a utility is an overhead. So the way to think about it is what is an overhead and what is a direct material is, can you make your whatever you're making, does whatever you're making consume this material, if it consumes it to make it, then it is material, not overhead. Make sense? Okay. That's fascinating. Okay. 
And then the next thing is cash flow. So cash flow in finance, we say, if you learn nothing in finance, you need to know cash is king. The fastest way for a company to go out of business is to not manage their cash. Because in the end, if you owe money to somebody, cash, unless you have cash to pay, you're going to be called. Anyone played Monopoly? Bankrupt. Darren has on mute, but he did say it, right? Yes. So you're going to be called bankrupt. So therefore, you always need to keep a handle of your cash. If I owe $100 to Pete tomorrow, I should have $100 with me today. So tomorrow when Pete shows up, here is your money. Or I call Pete ahead of time and make an agreement that, hey, Pete, I'm sorry, I don't have the 100. Can I move it to by a month and I'll give you 102. So there has to be an agreement to defer the payment or it has to be paid. So the cash flow statement basically looks at sources of cash and uses of cash during a certain period. This is cash only. It's not an IOU. A lot of business works on IOU because we work on credit cards and future payments and we'll give you the money and so on and so forth. But when the money is due, it's due. And that is what a cash flow statement manages. And so as a, somebody who hasn't started a company, right now you're in the conceptual phase of starting a company. So you really don't have all these statements. So what you would create in the business plan is the same thing, but they're going to be forward looking, which means you're going to project it into the future. How many units are you going to sell based on that? How much revenue do you think you will make based on that? How much costs you're going to incur, right? So how would you predict how many units you're going to sell? Any thoughts? That is why you will use your market research survey to inform you. So suppose I sent a survey out. I surveyed 100 people. 10 of those people were interested in buying my product, right? And so out of those 10, five were interested in buying it at the price that I'm offering. So then I would say 5% of my demographic, whatever people I assume, like let's say, college students on college campuses. So let's say I'm selling a pen. Let's do an example. I'm selling the pen. The unique property of this pen is that it is orange in color, which means nothing, except when I write down, it smells of orange. It has the smell of tangerine. Now research has shown, true story, research has shown that the smell of tangerine improves focus. And grades, so there's a lot of research that shows that there's an improvement in grades by eight to 10% when you are surrounded by the smell of tangerine. So this pen, as I write, gives out the smell of tangerine. So you see, you're hearing my positioning statement coming out of the story, right? So now I come back and I say, so I go and survey the market. So I say, I have to have an initial hypothesis. I say, this is something that I don't think little kids would care about because they don't use pens. Probably middle schoolers, not really, but high schoolers who are really grade conscious or college people in college may care about, or maybe consultants who work long hours and really tired. So I put these three segments. I say college kids, high schoolers and consultants. And then I go and I run a survey on each of these demographics. And I find that the highest interest, so 5% of college kids are interested in my pen. So now I go and say, okay, now what is my marketing strategy? My marketing strategy is I'm going to go campus by campus by campus and sell this thing. So I'm going to, since I live in Lubbock, I'm going to go to Texas Tech, 40,000 students, right? So 5% of 40,000 is 2,000 students. So that's my market size right now. So, but in the first year, 
I can't really get all the 2,000, can I? Rich, you have a question? Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't want to disrupt your thought. I, I'm just curious as to what, what you think about in the pro forma of putting the cost of borrowing money. Let's say I know I have to borrow money to buy my capital equipment to, you know, make my whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you calculate that into the pro forma just as a- as Interest a, rate, so based it, on the current interest rates. Right, so so you, you would advise putting that in the pro forma mm -hmm. as well, say this is the cost of borrowing money, you know, whatever. Right, so if you're going to borrow, then you would put it in, but if you're going for investment, then there's no cost of capital. Okay. Right? Okay, so then we were, so we're in the pen example. So we say, okay, we can sell about 2000, but I can't do that in the first year. So now I'm going to make a real assumption. Until this point, everything was backed by data. So I'll say, okay, I, based on all the time I have available and all the things I'm doing and all the advertising I'm going to do, I'll assume 10% is a good number for the first year. So I'm going to assume a revenue of 10. And so I didn't talk about the price yet, right? So in my survey, when I ran the survey, I was selling a pack of three pens and I did survey from people willing and it cost me, let's say $5 to make a pen. So I started my survey and I said eight to $10, 10 to $15, 15 to $20. And so those 5% people were willing to pay 10 to 15. So I say, okay, I'm going to grab or willing to pay eight to 10. So I'm going to put it at 10 is my price. So I set it at 10. So now when I sold the 200 units, my revenue is 200 times 10, 2000. My cost was $5 per three pack times the 200, right? And so that's the next number I would put here is my cost. Now, the next year, it's not going to be that I'm only selling the same 200 pens. So I'm going to, next year, I'm going to do something different. So one thing we should never assume in a business plan is things happen to us and we do nothing about it. So you need to take action. So my action in this case would be, I'm going to go to A&M and Beauty and Rice. So I'm going to put the same 5%, which I got on my initial market and 10% of that number for the student populations of those schools. Plus, I'm going to assume that people are talking to each other. This pen is going to work well in Texas Tech. And I'm going to go and offer it during orientation. Again, steps that I took. Such that I'm going to increase my market capture at uh, Texas Tech from <coughs> 200 to 400. Then I'm going to have the for the 0.5% of UT population and a and population and so on and so forth. So that is how you project, project your sales and your expenses. Any questions with how we work through this example? And I'm sorry, normally my this fancy pen it writes so I can write it on the thing, but today it's not writing. So based on that, your pro forma will include, do you see here, Rich? It also has interest, right? So you're going to include all your costs in your pro forma. And then you'll calculate your key operating. So net income is your total revenues minus your total operating expenses. So you'll calculate that. And based on that, how would you get your loan? So the financing part of it is what Dr. Ryan deals with in the HubCamp 2. And then the pro forma statement, you will submit. So first you'll have, for the first year, it will be monthly. And after that, for the next three years, it's going to be annual. So for 2021, it will be each month. And then 22, 23, it's going to be annual. And you'll the format is revenues, expenses, operating cash, the cash you need to run your normal operations, investing cash, cash you need to buy heavy equipment or any of your PPE and all that. And financing cash is the cash you need to service your loans and the cash you will get from investors. Any questions?
Um, if we're preparing for the uh, workshop this weekend, um, what kind of uh, preparation should we have uh, in regards to like, you know, our financial statements and operating? Oh, none of those. Okay. So the workshop is more of learning how to pitch an idea. Okay. And you do not need much financial information or even operating. It's more related to what are you trying to sell and who would buy it? And then okay. what you would do is you would go out and you would, so in this in COVID land, I guess you'll do Zoom calls and phones and all that in order to understand who might be a customer, potential customer. So then based on that, you would come up with a market size. We spoke to 15 people and seven of them were interested and we it is a product tailored to uh, so in your case, you spoke to, let's say, 15 restaurants and seven of them were, let's say, interested. Then you'll see about 50% of restaurants seem interested in this product. So therefore, if there are a thousand restaurants in Lubbock, my initial market could be 500. I see. Okay. Right. But the big point is the key to winning the Red Raider startup competition is to make your ideas so compelling that you want everyone to jump on it and want to be a part of your team. Okay. <laughs> right? So you're going to pitch and make it exciting and attractive, talk about what you're doing, who. So with the first part, this first slide that we went through about what are you making for whom, why now, all of those is what you would use. Okay. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? We have yeah. a, a quick question. It's about the, the risks that we were talking about earlier. And you mm -hmm. mentioned that we, you know, we really, we don't want an investor to ask questions. We want them to read the business plan and, and that be done with it. But like, if I sat down with my team and we just blue skied, what could possibly happen? Can you go too far? Can you make yes. it look like you're too risky? Yes, exactly. Yes, that's a very good point, right? So one of the things you want to watch for is it is not catastrophic. So you cannot be too risky as long as you have a mitigation for each and every risk that you present. Right? So, as long, so as long as we have a mitigation strategy, it doesn't matter how many risks we Yes. Have. And now I'll go to the rule of thumb. Usually it's a good rule of thumb is about three to six risks is a good number in a business plan. Okay. Right? Thank you. Priya and uh, Darren, yes. one of the things uh, we do in project management as well as others when we're dealing with risk is we, I don't know if you ever heard of a failure modes and effect analysis. We look at each process or each one and we rank it by severity, uh, uh, probability of occurrence in mm -hmm. these three areas mm -hmm. and we get a number. And then uh, in, in places where I've had to pitch uh, projects in corporate, you know, I'll, I'll show those risk numbers and the, the higher the number, the higher the risk. And so that's another way to stratify things mm -hmm. after you've brainstormed and got, got your stuff. Just, I don't know if you all use that, Priya. That's a good way to do it, right? So where you list a probability and there's some of them. And so you never want to be more than a 0.2 or a 0.3 in probability because then it's a problem and not a risk. So if you are in that range, you are in that, the chances of happening is about 0.2, chances of happening 0 0.01. So you can list those. But again, you don't want to try to be more than six risks. That's like a good number. If you're usually less than three, somebody's thinking on your behalf. Any other questions? Right, so based on using the pro forma statement, you're going to come up with how much cash you need. So we are all now right now in the cash land. We are not talking about IOUs here. We're talking about how much cash do I need to start this company? How much, how many, so your cash is going to be a function of your operating cash, investing cash and financing cash. How much money you need to buy equipment? So I need to buy three machines. Each of them is 500,000 each. Well, I need a million and a half for machines alone but that's not good enough because I need money to pay, to buy the raw materials, to pay my initial, to my, pay my employees and so on and so forth until I make profit. So you need to calculate all of that. And based on that, you will go and ask for money 
And in Hubcam 2, we talk more about the capital part of it. How do you get money? I think with that, we have come to the end of our class. Any other questions? So Teisha is going to send out the uh, slides. Yes, Narcisse, you have a question? I think it will be almost the same as the one with, that was just asked. Like, would you have any advice, any other advice for somebody who's new and um, going to the workshop this weekend? It's just the same, like what you want to do is first bring your idea, right? Pitch it well. And one of the things, where am I? Somebody had a chat thing. So I can see you, it's better. Oh, okay. So one of the things is that you have, uh, bring your idea to the competition and pitch it. And sometimes, so what happens is this day two, they vote, everybody gets to vote on the ideas, right? And based on that, your idea may be picked or not picked. If it's not picked, doesn't matter. Pick, pick a team that you can go with. It doesn't mean that you're starting a company with them, but you can still win the Red Raider startup competition, especially this year we have some money, right? As being a part of a team. So think, listen to all the ideas and see which one works for you. Pitch your idea with maximum strength and see that you can, be. So one of the reasons some of the teams with very good ideas don't do well in the Red Raider startup is they have no enthusiasm. They come and they say, oh, I have an idea. I'm going to sell this. Or they are too technical that no one understands them, right? So pitch with enthusiasm, give, be vivid, talk about the real problem, right? And who would buy it? Why would they buy it? All of those things make a strong pitch. Sense? Good. Any other questions? Everyone good? All right. Thank you all for being patient. It's been a little crazy, but we made it. We made it this far. All the best to you all. I will see you in accelerator programs and I launch and all the cool stuff. I am not going this weekend. I quit at this point. Tisha doesn't know, don't tell her. But I may see you at the final pitch. Right. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Priya. Priya. Was really nice. Bye. Thank you. Who oh, hold the thought? Is Tasha saying anything? No, she's gone. Let me tell her that we are done. All right. See you all. Bye. Thank you.